Baby, girl, you're so damn fine, no Wanna know if I can hit it from behind, though no. I'm sipping on you like some fun wine, though When it's over, I press rewind, though Talking bands, I got it Benjamins in my pocket I prayed in my truth for some robbers And he's playing Batman, but he's gonna rob him Alright, moving day, again Moving again We need um, to buy one of these U-Hauls and just own it I feel like this is like the third time because like we moved Stephanie and I in Florida, we moved her mom, and then now we're moving me into my new apartment in Canada. Um, so a lot of you guys will know I'm Canadian. I live in Kelowna, British Columbia. So today we're moving everything out of my current apartment, or at least was up there, into our new apartment, which is closer to downtown. It's a really nice spot. We're really excited about it. And uh, I figured I'd just pick up the camera and do a vlog today. Rashawn is basically a really big part of the team right now so he's committed to doing one to two videos for me every week for now i'm going to be continuing to edit and produce all the science explained content he's going to do either one lifestyle vlog sort of like this one today and or one informative content like a standalone video where i'm kind of like explaining some topic or whatever so yeah today i just wanted to bring you guys along and i hope you guys uh, just sit back relax and enjoy the vlog First time I've ever had it because we don't have any spoons or any knives or anything. So I gotta eat it with the peel, I guess. You don't wash it, you just eat it, right? Most of the time I do, just to get some do you? extra fuzz off. This is actually my first time ever trying this. Now, a lot of people have done the kiwi challenge now, and I feel like most people did it with the peel on. I know. It's way did. harder with the peel on. Hmm. That totally changes the flavor and everything. Not to offend you, Jeff, because I eat way faster than you. I don't know why, you guys, <laughs> why you were way closer? Because it's it was very hard to chew the peel. Yeah, that so peel I is, could, is uh, I could do turgid. double the amount if it was like peeled. Here's an easy alternative: just kind of eat around it, like that. Or you can stop being a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> just eat it. What time is it? Two forty. I need a meal. I don't know, I can't produce it out of my body, so... How much room are we looking at? We're actually getting pretty low on room, so I think we're going to have to make two trips. Okay. Maybe we could still get that stuff in. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure, we can definitely get that stuff in. I think I'm just going to finish this off. Just chug, chug, chug. Oh, throat freeze. You look gassed, man. <laughs> that, was, that takes a toll. <laughs> All right, so guys, that's pretty much it. Uh, place is completely cleared out. Now it's just a matter of putting everything back in place at the new spot. Boom. All right, so guys, we're here in the new place. Check it out. Yeah, while well, we were <laughs> taking care of the rest of the stuff, Stephanie was here basically okay. putting all the stuff away. So you actually made a lot of ground. Yeah, all the boxes are open. Yeah, that's sweet. So basically this is like the main living area right here. Our couch will probably go over here. I think we're gonna put the TV here. And then this opens up onto the deck. Here. This is a hot tub. Definitely make use of that. Oh, look at that guy. <laughs> What's up, man? Trying to get in. I'll run around and let you in. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I wanna give a shout out to Pat. You guys probably know him, he helped us move in yeah. a lot, so I appreciate it, bro. Pass the pencil, and then look me up. <laughs> and Eddie, Eddie's on his way in too, and he helped us out a lot, so. And Rashawn, of course. Real friends camera. help you move. Yeah. <laughs> Don't ever forget that. All right, so we're gonna finish putting all this stuff kind of together. Do you have a mission for tonight? You wanna get everything? Um, at least like the couch, but the entire kitchen is put away. Yeah, that's crazy. You did that fast. So, like all of the, this is all done and everything. So we're just gonna get a little more situated here. Just kind of chill for the night. It's been a bit of a long day uh, moving. And then tomorrow, we're gonna go work out. So I'll catch up with you guys tomorrow and we'll hit it then. Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome to the next day. Uh, I got a really good uh, night's rest last night and we've put some things together a little bit more. So we've got the couch in its proper place. We've got the desk over here. <laughs> That's true, she's not lying. I and I helped, I helped get the bed put in place a little bit, right? So basically today I've just been kind of like doing some odds and ends work and I just finished reading a part of November's issue of Mass 
and I read this piece on training to failure and I just wanted to quickly summarize that for you guys. Um, training to failure is something that I'm personally really interested in, in terms of a topic, because I think it has really important implications for your training programming. So I'm gonna lay the camera down over here and I'll quickly talk to you guys about this piece and this month's issue of Mass. All right, so training to failure. This is a topic that I think in the past I've kind of flip-flopped on a little bit because on the one hand, you have the argument that goes like, if you train to failure too early on in your workout, then you'll accumulate a lot of fatigue and that'll ultimately limit the amount of total volume that you're able to do in that workout. So let's just take for an example, say you have three sets of eight to 10 reps to do on the bench press, and let's just say 225 pounds. Uh, so you go in, you do your first set and you go to 10, and that's all out to failure. Uh, so you couldn't have gotten another rep. On your next set, you're not gonna be able to do 10 reps again. You might only get seven or maybe eight reps, even assuming you take that set completely to failure. On your third set, you might only get four or five reps. So the total rep volume there would be 10 plus seven plus five, so say 22 total reps. Whereas if you left a rep or two in the tank on your first set, you wouldn't be as fatigued for sets two and three. So you might get say nine reps on your first set and then eight reps on your second and eight reps on your third, total of 25 total reps. Um, so you've got 22 or 23 reps versus 25 reps. You get more volume by not training to failure. On the other hand, you have some people that say that in order to activate a full spectrum of motor units and fully activate those larger, higher threshold muscle fibers, you need to take sets to failure, or at least sufficiently close to failure so as to activate as much musculature as you can. And if you don't do that, then you're missing out on some potential growth. And I think that in the scientific community, you do have people arguing on both sides. And as for me, uh, I'll just leave my own personal opinion out of it, but we'll dig into the present study, which is a 2017 study that took 10 trained young male subjects uh, which was nice because on average they actually had eight years of training experience, which is quite rare for a lot of, of exercise science research. And they took them through three different protocols. Because the study only had 10 subjects, they used a crossover study design. So basically every subject ran through all three protocols and the protocols were separated by three, four week washout periods where they weren't running any protocol. So as for the three groups, uh, they had one group that was doing a high volume training protocol to failure. They had another group that did high high volume, but not to failure. And then they had a third group that did low volume, also not to failure. So the high volume to failure group did three sets of 10 reps on the Smith machine bench press and Smith machine squat. And all of those sets were taken to failure. So they did 10 reps with their 10 rep max. The high volume not to failure group did the same thing, except they only did five reps with their 10 rep max. So basically for every set, they were leaving five reps in the tank. So it was taken to say an RP of five instead of an RP of 10. In order to match volume, they did six sets of the bench press and six sets of the squat. Uh, so volume was matched, one group was going to failure, the other group wasn't. And then the low volume, not to failure group, uh, basically did three sets of five reps with their 10 rep max. So they measured a bunch of different stuff at a bunch of different time points, uh, but I'll just focus on sort of the main ones. Um, so for performance, they measured counter movement jump, uh, maximum height in a counter movement jump and this was sort of like a proxy for just general overall performance. They also measured mean propulsive velocity on the Smith Machine bench press and then Smith Machine squat. Uh, so basically they took a set load and saw how fast the subjects could move that load at different time points. They also took a bunch of blood samples and measured a bunch of stuff in the blood. Uh, importantly for recovery, they looked at creatine kinase levels, which is sort of an indirect marker of muscle damage. And they also looked at things like growth hormone, uh, testosterone to cortisol ratio, uh, and so on. So they measured all this stuff at different time points. So they took a bunch of measurements before the training session. Uh, they took more measurements immediately after the training session. Then again, six hours after training, 24 hours after training, 48 and 72 hours after training. So this was an acute study design. So that is to say they weren't looking at long-term changes in strength and hypertrophy over time, uh, but rather just sort of a short-term snapshot of these different acute variables following a training session, which can give us clues as to how it is people recover in response to different training protocols. So what they found was that both the high volume and low volume, not training to failure groups, didn't see a whole lot of differences. Really the only significant difference I think was that growth hormone was higher in the high volume, not to failure group, 
than the low volume not to failure group. But that was only immediately following the training session. Uh, so not much difference in the not to failure groups. However, there were quite a lot of differences between the group training to failure and the groups not training to failure. So what I found to be most interesting was the difference in performance between the groups. Uh, so for the not to failure groups, the only performance measurement that was affected was the counter movement jump. And that was only affected immediately after training. Whereas in the failure group, uh, the counter movement jump and the squat were impaired for 24 hours following the training session and the bench press was impaired for 48 hours following the training session. Also creatine kinase only took 24 hours to return to baseline in the non-failure groups, whereas it took 48 hours to return to baseline in the failure group. And there were some other measurements that were kind of important to look at as well, and they're <laughs> fleshed out in the issue in a little more detail, uh, but basically everything is pointing towards the idea that training to failure takes a lot more of a toll on the body, and as such takes a lot longer to, or at least a nice bit longer to recover from, than not training to failure. So now with this study, it seems that we have pretty convincing evidence that even when volume matched, uh, training to failure causes significantly more fatigue and significantly more of an impaired performance than not training to failure. And in the piece, Eric highlights an earlier 2016 meta-analysis which showed that there were no really significant differences between training to failure versus not training to failure in terms of strength and hypertrophy. And this actually wasn't dependent on the exercise type. So isolation versus compound movements or training experience. So in terms of practical takeaways from this, it seems to be the case that if you can get very similar strength and size gains from training to failure and not training to failure, and not training to failure allows you to recover better, uh, perform potentially more volume, and at a higher frequency, you should use training to failure more sparingly. That isn't to say that you should never train to failure or it doesn't have a place in one's program. I think that a lot of people could benefit from training a little bit closer to failure. In fact, I think a lot of people do underestimate how many reps they left in reserve. And sometimes people just need to push themselves that little bit harder to get those extra results that they're looking for. But with that said, I think that that mentality should be used intelligently and perhaps more sparingly for some. And in the piece, Eric gives the recommendation that you should save failure training for isolation exercises only, and you should save it for your last set of your last exercise for a given body part. Also in an unreleased interview that I did with Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, he sort of paid lip service to the idea that you can periodize failure training kind of like anything else. So you can have blocks of training where you're training very intensely and you're taking a lot of sets to failure. And then you can have other blocks of training where you're focusing more on volume and maybe taking less sets to failure. Okay, so that covers uh, most of the science that was covered about failure training in this issue of Mass. Hopefully that was informative for you guys. I'm gonna finish this pre-workout and I'm gonna head for a push workout. Um, so you guys seem to have been uh, enjoying the edits that Rashawn has been doing for the channel. Um, so we're gonna jump into an edit very soon for this push workout that my friend and Pat and I are gonna get into. Uh, so I will catch up with you guys in the gym. Uh. Yeah. Siege. Riley. Taz. Yeah, set me free and give me death, there ain't no other choices When I lay down and go to sleep, I keep on hearing voices Little whispers in my head, man, is you fake or loyal? Down to baby, pick your poison These little demons living underneath my bed, creeping Know the real monster lives above them all, sleeping That subtle breathing in your closet every single evening Thought you never see me again, looks can be deceiving And when you hear the sound of the drum, we'll be saying, here we go